Hi there folks and welcome to the final lecture on the topic of the basics of elasticity in the geodynamics course. In this lecture, lecture number six on the topic, we're going to talk about isotropic stress. And there is only one goal in this lecture and that is to look at the equations of the volumetric change in rock under isotropic stress. So what do we mean here? Well, as you may have already figured out, isotropic stress refers to the case where all three principal stresses are equal, and in this case, non-zero. Um, so this means sigma one equals sigma two equals sigma three, and if you remember our definition of pressure, these are exactly equal to the pressure. Pressure is simply the mean stress, and if all three stresses are equal, then each one is equal to P. And then that represents a state of stress that we can call isotropic. In this scenario, we can also say that our principal strains are equal. So that means that the three principal strains, epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3, are equal to one another and equal to one-third of capital delta, which is the dilatation. Remember, that's simply epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 plus epsilon 3. Now, from the equations of elasticity in terms of stress, we can say that the pressure P is equal to 3 times lambda plus 2g over 3. Remember, lambda is one of our Lame parameters. G here is the shear modulus, and this term is multiplied by the dilatation delta. Now, this is something of a special term out in front here that gets its own letter, capital K. That is the bulk modulus for the rock. Remember, these are both just material properties, so this is also a material property K, the bulk modulus. It's a measure of its incompressibility, or it's a measure of its resistance to compression, and its reciprocal which is 1 over beta, is a term called the compressibility. Now we can say that any change in the volume of rock must conserve mass. So what that means is for a parcel of rock with a given volume V, a change in volume in the rock dV or delta V will result in a change in density in that parcel of rock. So the Parcel of rock uh, itself contains some mass, which is rho times its volume, and we're saying that the change in rho times v must be equal to zero. It's simply a conservation of mass, or a way of stating a conservation of mass. So if we squish this piece of rock and compress it, its density must go up uh, as a result of that compression because we've not lost mass in the volume. We've just changed its size. Now, in terms of the dilatation, we could say that um, the dilatation is equal to minus delta V over V. It's also equal to delta rho over rho. And so here you could see that if our volume decreases, then our density would go up and vice versa. They have the opposite sign. And this, again, this holds true as long as we assume that um, the dilatation delta is small. Now, taking that, we can say that the density change is simply a function of pressure, compressibility, and the initial density. In other words, delta rho is simply the initial density rho times beta, which is the compressibility, times P, which is the pressure. And that you can get from the equation above. So finally, in terms of the bulk modulus and compressibility, we can just find those in terms of our elastic parameters as, remember, the bulk modulus is equal to 1 over the compressibility, which is equal to the Young's modulus divided by 3 times 1 minus 2 nu, which is, again, Poisson's ratio. Now it's time for our last set of questions in the topic of the basics of elasticity. <coughs> And there are two questions, so um, I'll ask you to once again pause the video, think about the questions, and come back. First question is, what does 
this relationship suggests about rock incompressibility or compressibility as a function of Poisson's ratio. And the second question is actually really just kind of a hint uh, as to how to think about the first question, and that is what happens to this bulk modulus K as Poisson's ratio approaches one half. So I'll let you go ahead and um, think about that for a moment and come back when you have an answer. All right, so what did you come up with? What happens to the bulk modulus K when this new, the Poisson's ratio, approaches one half? Well, if you put in the extreme value of this, put in one half here, what you see is you get one minus two times one half, or one minus one, and you are dividing by zero in that case. So in other words, the bulk modulus is infinite. If you put in a value that's very close to one, what you'll see is that this term down here is going to be very, very small for a Poisson's ratio that's very close to one half. If it's just below one half, you'll have a tiny term here, and you'll divide Young's modulus, which is already quite big, by a tiny term, and you'll get a very, very large bulk modulus. In other words, what we can say is that as Poisson's ratio approaches one half, the bulk modulus goes to infinity. Now, that should make some physical sense. Previously, we've seen that a Poisson's ratio of one half for uniaxial stress means the material is not compressible. Here, what we're saying is that as you approach that one half value, the ability for that material to be compressed, its resistance to compression, or the bulk modulus, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it's saying I'm not going to be compressed as the Poisson's ratio value gets closer and closer to one half. Okay, so that's it for the basics of elasticity, and it's time once again for your quiz. So you can see what you've learned from this lecture in the quiz, and you'll get an opportunity to apply some of these equations when we next meet for class to work on the exercises.